Uh, I'm back doing a uh, podcast interview, and this one's during the day, which I know you guys like because I'm more lucid. You know, the further in the evening I get, the stupider I get. And uh, so uh, I like doing these during the day. So I adjusted my schedule, scheduled time so that I can do more of these during the day. In case you haven't already seen this, I'm pointing to it right now. This little QR code takes you right to the website so you can listen to all 154 episodes that are up now and then you can listen to this one it comes out too but if you're watching live thanks for watching i am now only streaming to youtube because i'm trying to get my youtube channel uh pumped up so if you want to watch this you're going to have to follow me on youtube or see that i shared it on facebook so that's the only way you can see it i'm uh, stoked for it today though uh let me let me find my intro here. I've got uh, Rich Scheidner today, and uh, Rich is a comedian, actor, writer, and producer, and he's appeared on The Tonight Show, both with Johnny Carson and Jay Leno, and Late Night with David Letterman. His acting roles include Married with Children, he played uh, Al Bundy's co-worker, and Beverly Hills Cop 2. He's got two great books, one called I Killed, True Stories from America's Top Comics, and Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Boom. That's the one I read, and it's fantastic. And both of those give great insight to the heyday of stand-up comedy. He, his multimedia show, America's Reflection in the Funhouse Mirror, A History of Stand-Up Comedy, gives the audience a ride through the evolution of stand-up and celebrates the two soon-forgotten trailblazers who developed the art form. Let's bring him up right now. It's Rich Scheidner. Hey. Hey, I was going to bring you up hey. as Itchy, Itchy Snyder, but I didn't know how that would go. <laughs> that was... That's what Jackie Martling tagged. <laughs> I should have, I should have just kept that name. I should have just dropped what I had and went with that. One. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for doing the show. This is a real treat for me. Thank you, thank you, man. It, it I, is, I, you know. I mentioned that I've had quite a few of the. Um, folks that you mentioned in your book on on the show. I've had folks like Dreesen. I had uh, Jeff Altman. I recently had Rita Rudner, and she uh, mentioned you positively in her latest book. So that's a good thing. Uh, and that's always a good thing. Wouldn't anyway, Just give her a plug. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got to ask you one thing right off the bat, because I was researching you a little bit before uh, the podcast, and it says you're married to Kay Scheffler, and I was wondering if Kay, not anymore? That was marriage number two. Okay, so okay, we're, you we're were married to Kay. Now, but yeah, Kay, well, you're going to ask me, you're going to ask me about Kay? Yeah, is she, is she related to Mark? No. Okay. She's, she's from Austin, Texas, originally. She's now Kay Wolf, and she lives out in, uh, Okay, cool. 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 I was I was just wondering because Mark Scheffler was my fourth interview on on this show. So uh, and and he's uh, a cool guy. I just I, th that that name is uh, not common enough that I thought maybe there could be a connection there. He, he's Scheffler, right? And she's Schreffler. There's a oh, R. Okay. Okay. First off, yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, we got that out of the way. That's good. <laughs> For some reason, I just accidentally took you out of the feed. So, yeah. one of the th one of the things that really struck me is, and and I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce around quite a bit here, but one of the things that really struck me is that you helped jo Jeff Foxworthy write the two two of his albums that won Grammy awards. Yes, uh, Jeff came to me. Uh, I was writing for his TV chef and I first met like one of the first times he ever went on stage. He won the Southeastern Laugh Off. <laughs> and, uh, he, he was what you call the natural. Uh -huh. And uh, and very well. And uh, it was really fun to work 
with him. He's a he's funny guy, hard working guy, great guy. But, you know, I mean, you know, you 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 take my material because I'm from South Jersey and a little um, South Jersey, you know, a little faster speaking than Jeff does. And Jeff had to put it in to take material that maybe I'd done or stuff that we came up together, but he put it into his cadence, which so mm. that you write for people, but they always have to take it and, and put it into their. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know. Are, are you familiar with Dobie Maxwell? Of course. Okay, great. Of course. So yes. Dobie told me a great story when I interviewed him that uh, Jeff had, I, I think they were doing a show either in Illinois or Wisconsin, and Jeff, after the show, was bouncing the idea you might be a redneck uh, if off Adobe, of and Doby said, "Yeah, that'll never fly." <laughs> he, he he probably wasn't the only one that said that. Yeah, but it was in Michigan. He was there was a there was a place. It was a, and and I remember working this place. A comedy. Club was in a bowling alley. Uh -huh. And when Jeff saw that, and they're like, and Jeff goes, Oh, you got you got valet parking at your bowling alley. You got red <laughs> And he I think he wrote, you know, in a bat and on his front door of his house, uh, whatever it was, five or six redneck jokes that he wrote. Uh -huh. the first five or six wrote. That, that's like that's on the back door, that's on the back of the front door, like yeah, this is what started it. This is what paid for everything, uh -huh. right? I love it. Yeah. So one of the things about the book is you remember so many minute details about your time in the '80s, and as a um, fellow person who uh, consumed quite a few substances himself, what I what I don't understand is how you remember all that stuff. <laughs> Well, there's a couple of things. One, I had notebooks and I was, you know, I was not, a, I never, I did actually write down a lot of notes and I wrote down a lot of things in those notebooks and I, I actually had, that helped me when I was putting it together. Then there was the memory of other people's memories. I called up to get their memories of certain incidents that I would have, have right or, or sometimes not all completely wrong. Mm. <laughs> You know, you know yourself, comics, we pick up stories, pick up stories to tell for years, right? Yeah. For years about us growing up, my buddies and I, we were drunk and hit a train, hit, hit a moving train, right? Uh -huh. Bounced off the wheel. And if we missed the wheel and gone under the train, we we're dead. Yeah. Bounced off the wheel and we still didn't know what happened. And moving train right in front of us. I told that story for years at one time about. About three, four years ago, I'm telling that story. My word, in that car, you were in the second car. <laughs> you didn't hit the train. I not to be in the train hitting car. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, we do yeah. extemporize things a little bit as we yeah, get older. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I probably have a few stories like that too. I, uh, I, I do know that my one of my best friends uh, fell asleep driving one time, and he did go under a semi, and it took the top of his car off. And if I'm six five, if if it would have been me, it would have taken my head off. He was a little bit shorter, <laughs> and uh, fortunately, he leaned over when he fell asleep, so he got to keep his head. <laughs> Man, I know we're we're. we're... Yeah, that's that's wild. So one one of the things that I, I in, in talking with a lot of the old improv and comedy store folks, it, it seems very evident that the climate and the um, I guess the competitive nature that was built there is what made all you guys find some sort of success i mean just about everybody if they didn't you know if they didn't do stand-up they got into writing uh or they got into acting you know you, you got michael keaton that went into acting and scheffler that we talked about he went into writing uh and things like that it, most of 
so many of you stayed in the entertainment industry and did well. Do you think it's it was just like some magical uh, situation by having those comedy clubs there? Or was it the times or was it the people? What do you think went in to making so many of you guys do so well? Well, there was a combination of things. Remember that, that so many people went to L.A. who would go there and they'd see, oh, I can't get on stage there. They'd hang around the fringes for a couple of months and then move back to wherever they were from. People from New York moving to LA. I moved from Washington, D.C. to live in New York and do New York City. This was back in that time mm -hmm. when I moved in 82. Letterman wasn't on his first show. He was late night with David Letterman wasn't on yet. There was nothing happening in New York City. So when you were big time, it, you had to go go to LA. Everything was in LA. So you're so many people who'd come out and try the people who were there were hanging, were getting that exposure. So when people were looking for a sitcom role or whatever, we they could go into the comedy clothes, that person is funny. Can they act in my sitcom standards? You know, we were there. You were just there. Yeah. There to be seen. It was also part of the times, I mean, we hit that role. I mean, i I was doing stand-up comedy three years in Washington, D.C. I was opening up for a lot of bands, and I was getting a little work here and there. And I, and so when 1980 rolled around and these clubs started popping up like crazy, I was ready. I, had, I mean, they had crowds. They had packed audiences. They needed comedies who could do the time. You'd be surprised how many couldn't do the time because all you needed to do in New York City at that time was 15 claim 15 20 because they were all tourists mm -hmm. coming into the city they couldn't see comedy in their home, even in queens or they couldn't see comedy in in long island so they were coming into the city comedies could survive on 15 20 then they go out to go to pittsburgh comedy club you know they couldn't do this they couldn't do the where you're from because it's like where are you from pittsburgh we're all from Pitt on <laughs> move <Moving> on <laughs> You know, what do you do for a living? We work at that factory across the street. Didn't you see it? That, let's go. Do some jokes. Yeah. <laughs> so you're acting with crowd work. Like, so I was I was lucky that I had that. I had a burn. I had a burning desire to tear all the time to come up with more and more material. I loved the smell of new jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Did the, uh, did the concept of host feature, um, uh, main act come about in the eighties when you were working. Yeah. I mean, there's some, you know, a uh, Jerry Stanley who had all these clubs at other bars. He's really out of, of New York city started in 79. They'd send three comics out and you know, three equal comics. Everybody does 20, 25 minutes. And then pretty soon you start realizing you couldn't do the time and who was strongest and things started adjusting, started adjusting, and no comic to bring the acts up. And then we're, oh, I just need, and then they'll, you know, so you just sort of develop. I think it's exactly sure. East Coast, West Coast, exactly where the three acts show happen. But, it, you know, then then you have all these local comics would be the MC. So you go to Atlanta, a lot of local comics, like right as soon as the punchline opened in 82 in Atlanta, but he's seen Foxworth is part of that scene. And you know, there yeah. were a lot of Greg, there were a lot of Jay Anthony, there were a lot of comics down there. And so they go, well, we don't need to bring it out. We can use these guys, then bring in a middle act and a headliner. And then that's sort of developed where the locals became the MCs. Already. Mm. And what do you think as far as, you, you you were there when okay there used to be New York and L A and then you know um, Atlanta popped up Phoenix popped up and all all these clubs started popping up um, yeah and then just all of a sudden it went from a few to hundreds of them in just about every major city. Do you think that the um, that that the comedians were ready for that? Do you, do do you, from what you saw, do you think that they were yes. ready to go? There were scenes. There were scenes, comedy scenes. Like we didn't know they existed. This 
this premier guy comes out. He comes out to um, um, uh, to Washington D.C. called El Brookman's, where all these comics: Lewis Black, Kevin Rooney, Ron Zimmerman, T. P. Mo Rooney. All these comics were hanging out and uh, doing right. And then there was scenes in Boston and in Houston and Philadelphia, and Chicago scenes. So when these clubs sort of opening, there were comics who had been working in these scenes, even not that there were scenes, right, mm -hmm. in these cities. And so those comics became part of the feed. And also, you, 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 you remember this is sort of like the baby of age where they weren't going to go to a rock concert to date anymore. Right? You know, they're a little yeah. older, so now the place. Yeah. So these, these clubs kind of fulfilled that. And then people were dating, and the I obviously expanded it with the clubs. I mean, you start working the road all the time. You're act if you're and working hard, you can build so much material so fast because you're doing eight shows a week. And like they did, this is before Mothers Against Drunk Driving <laughs> changed drunk dr attitude towards drunk driving in the mid yeah. '80s. But in the early, those club owners were just selling drinks. In two or three hours to close the show, go ahead. Yeah. We're selling drinks. They didn't care they were sending us out into the night. They're just going, we're selling drinks. Yeah. And, you know, and so they, they, you know, which comics would sell the most, have the biggest, like, oh, you know, <laughs> I sold $15,000 worth of drinks. I said, well, <laughs> my liver can't take it. I may get you about 9000 <laughs> Drink stage. He do shots hey everybody you're in pittsburgh you, you can get them to buy 10 sh shots just toasting the steelers every 30 seconds <laughs> i remember i worked in a bar in the 80s and uh, that's when this was in indiana and uh the law was passed that the uh bartender could be held liable if they sent somebody out drunk and that that's when i decided working in a bar probably wasn't my thing anymore <laughs> And, and that's when they started doing the time shows in the comedy club. And that's when you started getting the checks. They were just kind of catching money as they went along. And, and maybe somebody might have a tab. But all of them show, hour and a half show, we're looking. So they 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 dropped the checks like an hour, hour into the show. He was on stage and all of a sudden he loses the attention. You know, you the check spot. You know, everybody, yeah. he's looking at their bills. These jokes, say hey, not. Looking at bills, looking at me, not so fun anymore, right? Yeah. Hey, you know, right? Like, and the comics learned to have, you know, like, I would just start doing crowd work and treading water until you knew they, you had your big clothes or finish, but they, they had time shows then. They didn't want you to do two hour shows. Yeah. It's amazing how that has pretty much stuck for all the comedy clubs that are still around. That, it, they, I guess it's a if if it's not broke, don't fix it type thing. But uh, yeah, that's just the way it is. They haven't changed all those things you're talking about. They haven't changed. The bars are responsible. The clubs are responsible. They're not, they're not going to change because the the attitude towards drunk drivers hasn't changed. Yeah, yeah, and the you know funny thing is is for comedians, uh, a lot of other things haven't changed. There's still shitty rooms, shitty bookers, and shitty audiences. So. <laughs> <laughs> It's all there. They had, you know, there were always crappy places. There were all these little, these little runs you would do, you know, because only did all these comedy club owners, like they're the ones that had the, you know, mechanical bulls. They, you know, they would just look, sell drinks. So yeah. comedy was it. You know, they had, some of the rooms still had the disco ball hanging up when it was at the tea. Come in to do comedy, the disco balls hanging right over the stage. It was the discotheque, you know. Yeah. Mechanical bull in there two months before. And also a lot of these bookers used to book rock. They didn't book Kansas or they didn't book Springsteen or Hart or whatever. They booked the smaller band, taking the same circuit, a bar circuit they had for those bands and put comics on them. So you had all these yeah. in the Kentucky thing and then up in the Northwest, David Tribble, right? The Tribble runs. They, they These are a lot of rock and roll book turn into comedy bookers yeah 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 and it's uh it's it's 
similar but not 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 quite the same because you you kind of want to put you know if you're going to put three of them on a show you don't you, you don't want to put like direct you, you want them to complement each other instead of uh instead of being completely different but uh yeah it's 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 a different different story uh put them into a venue where people actually might want to pay attention i mean yeah. you put, put them into these rock and roll venues, you get the crowd to go what is this now you know yeah it's like <laughs> they're just we just gave some beer bottles of chicken wire that's what we're here to do yeah <laughs> Now I I had the opportunity you you've got some of your early stuff I found it on YouTube and one of the things you talk about is how good Leno was um a, as a stand up before before he got into the Tonight show and you talked a little bit about last per minute and as I watched your set I I was thinking about Leno's sets I compared yours to a lot of Leno's sets I mean you were you were very quick you uh understood your audience you had a you had a beat you had a rhythm to what you were doing up there how long how long do you think it took you to figure out who you were on stage um I guess really. I mean, when I got to New York City, things really accelerated. You saw people up there. I saw Gilbert Godfrey one too many times <laughs> at the improv and <laughs> catch store. I went down to the books and burned them. I burned them all. Yeah. <laughs> I had a I said, make a new act like a phoenix, but this is not gonna happen. This yeah. is not happening. So you know, I that was my shedding and shedding shedding and shedding and but you do it all the time but i i had that burn i i knew it was all a function of stage time you knew that instinctively mm. you know you're not a guitar player who could sit out and show everybody what you practice you got to be on stage in front of people and I, I i i remember this one guy we'd go like we'd come back from doing a, a stanley gig out and dollars was a lot of money my rent back there i think was 115 dollars was a month down the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. It's in rent, right? So you come back down. A lot of guys came back after they did the Jersey gig. They just go right to the bar and start drinking. After I finished Monday, I go over to the improv. You know, the improv was like the staging place of the, on the West Tunnel. I'd go over to the bartender or go, you know, or see who's emceeing or who's running the show and say, I call over a catch. Can I get on soon? Yeah. How about the comedy strip? Go do three more sets that night. That's, didn't look at it like you're over it. As long as there were people on stage, I'd run over to Triple Inn, which was a little place, a funky <laughs> little bar. You know, I'd go anywhere, and 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 just to get on more stage time until the night, as much stage time as you can get. You talked about uh, you you you're doing these these shows and then partying all night but every morning you got up and you would drive around the town you're in with your with your uh with the other comics and find out things you could make fun of but you're also writing every day did, did you have like a cadence where you wrote every day yeah i got that from seinfeld i mean when i first met seinfeld he was saying you know you and and the thing i found is even if i didn't find the punch line you know if i just worked on the by folk Focusing on the daytime, it was in my mind when I was on stage that night, and I would try it. And you don't like to be embarrassed so much. It's sort of, it more times than not, I found a punchline that worked on stage. It happened probably more than actually writing a complete joke and going on stage with that. So I found out the more that I wrote in a day, it worked at night. Yeah. It handed it. And, and, and as much as I mean, might be hungover, and I'd, I'd always try to squeeze some time you know i'd squeeze time working on the notebook uh, for you know for an hour before I, I went out to the clubs i it just had to had to go through stuff it had that, that that's great what what as far as um i lost my train of thought i'm getting older um lewis black one of the things you mentioned yeah. is you got to see lewis black early on and you said that, uh, I, and it's been a while since I read that far back. But the uh, the Lewis Black was who he was, but the audiences weren't quite ready for him yet. Uh, <laughs> he or he 
in a lot of ways, he parallels Rodney Dangerfield to me. Both of mm. them attracted a younger generation, popular as big as he was, without our generation. And both Lewis and Rodney mock generation. Rodney mocked the whole American dream thing. You mm. know, the American dream was you could be anybody, a loser. Right? He was a loser. He mocked the American dream. Yeah, you know, here is this guy. You know, that he did, he didn't become anything he wanted in America. And Lewis Black, he mocked the baby boomers to the kids of the baby boomer. He looked like that. Their parents are just these impotent, squawking poodles barking at a freight train every night when they're, they're yelling. At the, it was the perfect sort of parody of that. Mm. And they both did that well younger generation which is really important it's really hard to do they're freaks that way and you get apoplectic and when he was younger it it looked like he was nervous or you know it, it just didn't work it, it, and as he got older and it fit it just all was like when Roddy came back, back you know from his time selling aluminum siding all of a sudden no respect yeah and when he's young you don't quite look like it. And Lewis looked like all of a sudden they were little things, which is hilarious. Which it's part of what makes him so funny, right? Yeah. Makes yeah. it loses I mean who loses their mind over a bottle of water? Lewis yeah. doesn't it's funny. <laughs> right. So to me, very, you know, in terms of you know, if they're on the on the same family tree in terms of comedy, will attract a younger generation. You know, mm -hmm. George Carlin of course famously, but Out of your class of comedians, I know some of them. Some of them went on to do different things, and some of them walked away from the business completely. Do you think that there's anybody that in that class that should have been a superstar like a Carlin or a Pryor, and they just uh, they for some reason or or another they walked away from them before they should have? Should have. Uh, I don't. I'm. Uh, I'm trying to think. Of, that's a good question. First, I'm like stunned. <laughs> but uh, it's a good question. Who walked made it? Because I can name people who were in a cusp, who died when they were in terms of Ronnie Shakes and and Dennis mm. Wolfberg were two comics who were really coming in mm. died early. Bill Hicks is famous. Famously, Bill Hicks was just getting ready to break huge. Mm. I mean, he was he was going to be that next. I uh, always go back to Lenny Bruce or whatever, yeah. but he was in that, you know, the line. He was constantly crossing the line. It's, it's almost mandatory now for the general to cross the line in some way to attract the crowd. Mm -hmm. Right? They want people who are rebellious up there. And Bill Hicks was top of top of his game when he when he went down. I'm trying to think of somebody who walked away before they could have made it. And I don't know. I mean, they, they, they beat their head like, like Richard Belzer, who just died. He was like, I was a fan. I mean, he, he yeah. his, his crowd work, nobody, I've never seen anybody still they're doing it. I don't see. It was just vicious attack. You didn't, it wasn't like people, he didn't act in that, in that way. Of of and and really, and I think he just got it because it wasn't really working. I remember him doing it, sort of changing, uh, um, changing to just drop the crowd work and doing all stand up and trying to be friendlier. You know, it just didn't really his persona. You know, so then he sort of left it, and of course had a great acting career. Right, but he he he'd taken it as far as he could take. Again, it just wasn't working. I don't know. I'm probably be calling you up <laughs> later. Calling, oh, oh. I can't think of somebody who walked because comics don't. They don't have a choice in the matter. Most comics I know, true, true comics, choice in the matter. Like, yeah, it's, it's not a. They never made the choice to do this. I mean, once, once I, age a friend of mine in law school took me to his stage, put me on. I bombed, bombed. Like, but I got one reaction, like one, huh, like that. Once I found that I could go on stage and actually, there was no question what I was going to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think for so many, it, there's nothing, you know, there was this guy, uh, Jeff Corey. You, you were a big acting coach out in LA and he did a lot of movies, a lot of movies back in the day. And he was one of those guys who was black. First day acting class, he'd say to everybody, uh, and this, this is acting class. He goes, write down a piece I'd rather do if you don't succeed in acting. Like, what else would you do? What else would you do? Uh, real estate agent. I, I, I would love to, uh, you know, and and you wrote something down besides nothing. If you were to, if you didn't write down, I can't do anything else, you're going to go do it anyway. Because right. the only people that I think survive in acting are the ones that think else. Yeah. And most like that. I don't, I can't, I can't think of anybody I know who way before they could have made it big. I mean, you see comics walk away after not making any money for 20 years or mm. you know, anywhere in the business. But I see people hang around who never get anywhere. Yeah. I mean, they just be gigs all the time and they do it for 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. It does take a little bit of an obsession to to be able to get anywhere in the business, I think. Even I, I, I agree that I totally agree that a lot of things, you know, the little luck of the draw too, you have to have a lot of things, but I'm saying just, just to keep doing it mm. when there's no, there's no sign that whoever you ever break through, like, you know what I mean? I know people like to hang on to that. I know guys are sixties and seventies going, but Roddy made it late in his 40s, not his uh -huh. 60s and 70s. Yeah. Roddy came back and did his first one back in, in the 60s, early 60s. So, you know, you know it wasn't like he he's 70 years old when he came back. Yeah. So it's 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 hard. Right. One of the things you talked about was, you know, pushing the line and, and how that was important. And r right now there's a situation where we've got half the comics saying that uh, cancel culture isn't a thing. And the other half are saying that they can't, they can't do their act. What's your position <laughs> on that? You know, just because the airplane doesn't mean you can fly an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So sometimes you belong and don't try to go into the, don't go off road. Yeah. You know, don't go into the weeds. And it's just it, you know. I mean, there are comics who are there are more and more comics doing theaters, comedy, more comics doing coliseums, there are more comics doing amphitheaters, there are more comics doing stadiums. And those comics you know, who are, you know, truly like line dancers, like Dave Chappelle or right? They they know how to work the line, they know how to cross it and come yeah. back. And from PC, have always been here. They people act like. Oh man, this is like a new thing. It's always been a form of corporate censorship. The network's telling you what you can and can't do when you're on, or, you know, they would stop because you can't do that one, can't do that one. You know, Bill Hicks famously on the Letterman show. There are mm. uh, corporate obstacles. If that's not corporate PC or, you know, people, oh my gosh, back in the, back in the, in the Vaudeville era, you know, W. He feels had a, a, they were trying to pass prohibition. They were trying to outlaw alcohol in America in, in 1920. But before that, there's this movement, this temperance lecture, which mocked it. He mocked them, right? Ah, oh, yes, they say you can't drink in multiple times, right? He mocked them and they tried to cancel the shows. They, they would, should, they would picket it and they would, call theaters and say cancel this guy uh -huh. they were they were trying it's it's always been around in some way but people who the, the, the in some way thumbing your nose at the line is almost required for a lot of comics and this is how the ship this when i was starting out when I, you had to work clean to get on tv so everybody now clean is a is a separate brand you yeah. advertise clean because you mean everybody regularly curses regularly mm -hmm. they curse regularly you know it's like you're expected you go into a show you expect to see cursing that's just that that's it 
clean now. We're starting now. X-rated was separate. They go, you're going to come see Bobby Slayton. Just know you're going to offend some people. This is an X-rated show. They would advertise X-rated the way now they advertise. changes. Always change. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny how the, the whole clean thing has so many different definitions now because it, when, when you ask a comedian to be clean, they're like, well, do you want TV clean? Do you want PG-13? Do you want church clean? What, what kind of clean do you want? Because there's, the, there's about five different definitions of it. Yeah, you, you want Marine boot camp clean? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I know. Oh, I've heard that. And there's but speaking, it's a it's a separate brand. It goes clean. Yeah. And I I've always felt like that that is such a limiting factor because you know when when I started I was clean and I was TV clean. And but I never build myself as a clean comic because I don't want to be stuck in that corner. And, well you didn't you didn't have to then. Yeah. Well, I've only been doing it since I was 52, so I did kind of, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, maybe maybe so, but I'm just saying, I mean, when, when they're going out there to do the shows, if you want people to, you know, you're going to draw a different crowd. It's all about marketing. They're just marketing themselves as clean. Some comics market themselves as clean. Some people, you know, Joe Coy marketing themselves as a, you know, Asian comic. Mm -hmm. uh, let those people know that you're marketing yourself that's all yeah yeah one of the things that's that i that i always thought was cool about the 80s scene is you guys had a lot of competitive spirit but there weren't any like major comedy beefs like you like you, you had the improv in the comedy store and you guys you, you guys gave each other shit and stuff like that but it was never it was never like this huge deal and now it seems like with the internet and everything else that these these comedy beefs get like uh, expanded and magnified and um, it becomes this whole cutthroat thing do you think that's good or bad for comedy these are show tempt us in a teapot there's not, <laughs> nothing more comic for than a showbiz feud everybody benefits from the show pay attention yeah i mean when somebody does a special i, I either see online chris rock does what he's comment they gotta comment they gotta comment they gotta say something yeah and and this is like good that's the whole special and not have people talk about it. you have have some controversy so that they'll talk about it with this i mean you know co comics again at a different time right again a different time i lost my train <laughs> <laughs> hey we both got one for today so that's good <laughs> well, if i went wait a minute that wasn't what we were talking about i got <laughs> to stop myself with that that back to real. Are you going to come back to the question? Yeah, it, w w just talking about how um, you guys in the eighties just seem to be more copacetic, oh, and now the, there's a lot more infighting. You know, there there are a few beefs in the mid late eighties. Uh, Sam Kennison, who liked to be content of that, he'd go on a Howard Stern show and he'd pick fights with Dice Clay and Dice, you know. And then he'd pick a fight with Bob Goldthwaite. So that, and, and of course, Howard knew to value these contracts. When you get people talking about it, you let, people love conflict. People like it, people love the, the sort of showbiz stuff. It drove people to pay attention to what was going on. But overall, because we didn't have social media, again, the thing was different. You know, people were trying to get famous or big. You want to get a sitcom. Back then, it was important to get on us having comics, you know, star in sitcoms. Mm. So then you wanted your own sitcom. Um, the the same thing. It was, and we look. I realized when I came back, I I, I back about um you know about about twelve years ago. I came back, start doing it again. So in my day, we'd watch each other, and if I if I saw you do something, and I thought of you a little bit 
or a callback or something of that nature that would help you. I'd rock cocktail napkins. You come up afterwards. Yeah. And I remember the first time I did that with a young comic and he looked at me criticizing my act. I said, no, no, no these are some ideas. Maybe they yeah. might work. <laughs> and I'm just offering them. I'm, and I'm not sure. I didn't. I said to you, you were funny. And I, you know, all of a sudden I'm backpedaling, right? <laughs> and it was a whole for us. That was a sign of respect. I remember the first time I, I went into Pittsburgh. One of the I first went in there in 1980, and I'd been there before. And I came in there, and it was a Saturday night. Hey, Gary Shandling's in town, and uh, he just did a, a private gig, and he wants to come over and do a little. Now, first of all, I'm like, wow, he's going to, you know, this is going to be rough. Because you know comics, right? give him. He says he's just going to turn into twenty five, and then I'm going to have a tough time yeah. following him, right? But he did five minutes, it's like, provide some stuff. And then when I finished, he came over to me, and in, in a stack of cocktail napkins, ideas, and of course they were great. He's scary. Shanling was one of the great comedy writers of my generation, stand up. But what I got out of it was respect. He thought enough of my act to watch enough of me to take the time to give me some ideas mm -hmm. and that to me was was important it, just a different generation different attitude yeah and i i do you know i'm i'm in huntsville alabama now and i've hey. you know, i'm one of the old old guys obviously but the once you once you know them a little bit um, you can do that, but like you said, if you don't know them and they come off the stage and you say, "Hey, try this," then uh, it's not so good. It's funny because I, I was at a mic. It was probably a month ago, and um, the comedian mentioned that uh, Angus Young was the lead singer for ACDC, and and when she came off the stage, I I just said, you know, just. Just so you know, for future reference, you know, it was Bon Scott and it was Brian Johnson and Angus was the guitar player. And she just gave me a look and walked away. And I'm like, well, yeah, you, you want to you want to be accurate. <laughs> not not that it means you tell them. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Uh, don't know. There's so many different factions now that that weren't there. We all were just comics, you know. Probably right about that. Back then, there were a hundred comics in New York, a hundred in L.A. Behind about that number, running around the two places, and with other comics as you know, various places outside of those two meccas. And so you knew pretty much everybody. Didn't tell everybody. Yeah. And everybody knew of you. So you're probably right about that walking up to strangers, but there's all different things. You know, if I'm an older guy, I I have nothing. To, if they ask me my opinion, I tell a younger person what I think they should do. First of all, because everything's changed so much, I'm not even sure what I'm to the conversation anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing what the 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 things that that whole '80s boom affected because even when you think about the movies that came out prior to the comedy boom, they were much more broad, you know, only, you know, Woody Allen had really smart stuff, but it, you, you didn't get the, um, uh, the snarky humor or the, the, the little aside type jokes that you, and the eighties that started, that started coming and you can see it as a direct result of stand up. And, and, and the effect, you know, it's still, it's still happening today, you know, um, in, in TV and movies and everything else that, that whole, um, almost, um, almost, a, a set up punch type thing is, is a lot more in tune with what's going on today, um, than, than the old broad stuff where it was most more slapsticky. Well, you know, again, these are trends, right? So there's a whole trend of the, like you said, the snarky, the almost the, almost the anti in comedy. Mm. The, the comic's a bit of an, you know, like Larry David. He's he's America's a bit of a, a a bit of a curmudgeon, or the even his younger comics they got they got some serious flaw, whatever, and they're snarky. And then you have, 
have Ted Lasso comes out. Yeah. And I think part of the, he's such a genuinely nice guy. Yeah. And people are like, I want a nice comedian. And then you see younger comedians, Nate Bergazzi, some other ones who were just generally up there. Not, they don't want to offend. They, they want to do comedy that, that it's, it's not making any less funny. It's not less funny. It's just they're actor and friendlier than maybe somebody's, some of the others. So trends happen, and then somebody comes up with, good, I need something different now. I'm tired of this other stuff. It's always yeah. who's coming up with something new. Funny, uh, funny thing about Bargetsy is I, I've been to a couple of his live shows, mm -hmm. and his audience is so diverse. It's it, it's amazing. You, you see, you, you know, you see the um, Hicks and the flannel shirts, and you you see motorcycle gangs. You see every race and color. He's just he's he's universal. Him and Gaffigan are both uh, just universal. First of all, funny's funny. They're they're funny, but probably the common thread again. They know you know no matter what it is, they know they're going to get funny, but they also know they're not going to get. If they're not a, going to see a guy who's trying to walk the line or trying to create controversy. Yeah. Same with, you know, again, he's almost like of that generation. Brian was in comedy movement. I mean, mm. he came out there, he's doing comedy. You could bring your grandmother to your grandkids to as funny as anybody on the planet. Anytime. Yeah. I mean, he's knocked down. Fun and so, that doesn't make him any less funny, but he just decided this is what I'm going to do. And it was different. Like, I got to go edgier. I got to get edgy. I got to work edgy. He's like, yeah, nah, you can go at the edge. I'm going, to, I'm going to tear it up, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, fun, and the funny thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And the funny thing is, is I talk to a lot of comedians and there's, there's no less merit in somebody who's being edgy and uh, talking about current events and their opinion, the laughs from that to the person who's just talking about his dick fell out of his pants or whatever, you know, it's there, as long as the audience laughs, it's still a win and there nobody's better than the other one. No, I never, funny's funny. Whether you're dirty or clean, if you're funny, you're funny. That's yeah. it. You know, I, there, if you're not funny, there's nothing more painful. I think the most painful thing, bad comedy. It yeah. beats, believe it or not, in my opinion, bad poetry. Bad poetry reading. So I've been to some poetry where you go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're just in survival. But stand-up comedy has the promise that you're going to laugh. And when yeah. they don't fulfill that promise, yeah, I've uh, I've been the one not fulfilling the promise enough times. I know how that feels. Everybody has it sometimes. If you didn't, you didn't take a chance. You have to take. I mean, I used to take chances to find first of all, just to find out who you are up there. Yeah. But yeah, you got to try. There's stuff you go. You wrote down that day. You wrote it. You go. Wow, wow. This is complete. Complete. This is going to be great. You're going to stay tonight, and it doesn't work. You. Go, how did that not work? <laughs> it made other people laugh. You know, so, so especially something you might have made a couple of comics laugh or whatever. Just made these three com comics laugh. I just came up with a conversation. Yeah. And then you go on stage. It sometimes there. Other times you go, it's just not me. It, yeah. it, it doesn't work for me. I'm sure you have too. Oh, yeah. I gave stuff away. It doesn't fit me, but I gave it away. Right. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. I I want to talk a little bit, bit about the uh, history of comedy show because you really, uh, you know, I I got to hear on uh, Poveromo's show. I got to hear a little bit about the you know the first comedian and and all that kind yeah. of stuff. What what kind of things have you learned from that that um, make you understand what stand up has become more? Well. When they talk about uh, uh, stand up today, it's Lenny Bruce. It's sort of like stand ups have a place in society as social critics. Mm. See that it's always been a reflective art form. Comics don't change your mind. change your mind. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. If you you know if you take a comic who's and they're 
ultra conservative and you put them in front of an ultra progressive crowd or vice versa, you know, it, it comics reflect, they, they, they expose a hidden truth, expose new ones. Mm. And so it's always been what's reflected about America. What is the time? Do you look at the jokes, what they're laughing at? And I'll give you an example. So back in the 19, America went to really traditional gender roles. They wanted men in the offices and the and they wanted women in the house, you know, raising kids and being homemakers. And guys were still operating under that double standard. It's okay for the guy to go out and dog it, you know, the Virgin Mary at home, right? Mm -hmm. Well, guys were worried about going to home if they were doing the same thing in the home that they were doing out running around the offices or whatever in the bars or whatever. Mm -hmm. At an unbelievable amount of cheating jokes in the 50s and almost all of them being cheated on by his wife. <laughs> there were so many of those jokes and it reflected that jokes. guy comes home from work early try to catch his wife cheating on him and he finds his wife in bed with his shoes the guy and uh -huh. the wife says you keep that up you're not gonna have any friends left yeah <laughs> right so i'm i'm you forget that look can you edit because I, I yeah oh yeah i can you edit rely a guy a guy okay a guy comes home from work convinced he's gonna he's gonna find his wife cheating mm -hmm. on him he comes in right? comes in from home work early she's got a negligee on he says she got a negligee on i noticed him can't find the guy and he looks out the window he sees a guy in the street running below his window he says there the guy go refrigerator and he lifts up and he throws it out at the guy but the effort is so good refrigerator out the window and he has a heart attack and he died <laughs> now three guys are standing at the at the gator says these three guys Ah, new ones, huh? Okay. So he asked the first guy, how'd you get here? The guy says, cheating on me. I came home early from work. Couldn't find a guy, but I saw a guy running down on the street. So I picked up what he could do. I threw the thing out the window. I had a heart attack and I died. He asked the second guy, how about you? He says, well, I was running down the sidewalk. I got hit with a refrigerator. <laughs> he says, the third guy, how about you? He's refrigerator. <laughs> There was a million of, and it's because at the time there was so much angst that guys had about what, when they were cheating. Yeah. Right. It's so so f that's how it reflects. There's, you know, Mark Twain said, I must neither teach nor preach in my comedy, kind of, but I have to do a little bit of both if my comedy is going to live forever and by comedy changes with the times with the attitudes with the language the colloquial and it doesn't last long yeah it doesn't last like music it yeah. reflect the time yeah. the first comic artemis ward when he started he started a civil so first of all there was no social net there was no safety net there was no welfare there was you didn't work hard you didn't eat mm. you didn't work hard you didn't have a place to sleep so everybody worked her character he did a lazy character and that was comic relief that's how he reflected the time he said he did jokes like we must all learn live within our means even if you have to borrow money to do <laughs> that joke is from 1861 the timing right perfect timing and the war is going on and in a war comics have to audience from thinking about the war so he didn't do any jokes about the war after the war, edgier after every war things get edgier darker humor gets more cynical after mm -hmm. this guy he's the second stand-up comic and mark twain's got edgier material he's got dark sarcastic material he said things like we must change regularly for the same reason Yeah. <laughs> full of shit. Get it? Full of shit. Yeah. They both get full of shit. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I I just love that about it. And there's so so many other things, but how many reflects what's going on in the country at any particular time?
You know, it's funny. One of my notes here is comedy is a reflection of the current times. <laughs> because it, and, and that is true with art in general. If any, yeah. I, I don't think that, say, the music of the 60s, if, if you were listening to Joan Baez, it's because you had the same thought process as Joan Baez. No, nobody really changed any minds with their comedy, their art, their music. Not, they didn't change any minds. It just gave those people who were like-minded something to solidify their their stance. And it's funny, That's it's really the way the internet is now and really the way TV is with the competing networks. All it is is feeding, feeding fire into the people who are already drinking the Kool-Aid on social media things come up that make you feel good this yeah. is your endorphins or at least you're feeding you news and ads and videos of things because you've already gone to those places and clicked on them and they and it, it builds up then your little hour feeding it back to you mm. so it's constantly that's happening and people go to the the brief not to give them any kind of real truth, just to reflect what they already feel. Mm. You know, enforcement, a reinforcement of what they already feel. So you've gotten to see enough generations of comedy that you kind you kind of know <laughs> what comedy is all about. So if a new comic was to come to you and say, "Hey, Rich, what are the things that um, that are?" like non-negotiable in comedy. These things are the things that you have to do to get good at comedy. And it doesn't matter if it's 2023 or 1983. Yeah. That there's only one thing that I can think of the time. Again, that hasn't changed since the beginning of comedy. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. in, alone in your bedroom. You just can't. And maybe some guys can practice impressions in the tape recorder. That, but the actual getting laughs and has to be done in front of a lot for stand up comedy. The definition of stand up comedy is one individual performing for a live audience and laugh. That's as simple as it, I mm. got it. And for that, you have to be in front of a live audience. That's what I would tell them. But other than that, I don't know what's going on out there. They know more about what's going on out there after do because they're in front of their generation all the time. And that's mm -hmm. basically what it is most of the time. You know, look, you wanted to see rock stars up there around the same age as you. You wanted to see you want to see kind of people up there performing that kind of are the same age as you. Thing mm -hmm. and you understand the attitudes of those people better. When I was 25, 26, 27, I did a lot of kind of age to those people. Because mm -hmm. I'd just been there myself. So it was shooting fish in the barrel on a cruise ship all those people are my demographic again yeah. it's, it's fish in the barrel i know but if you you throw a, a 70 year old me in front of a college crowd they're gonna look like oh my god my grandfather's up there doing <laughs> comedy you know i'm beyond <laughs> man you know and then and then i don't even understand all the all the lines i don't know i say you can't go to college anymore. I bet people who are 25, 26, no problem working colleges. But older people might have a problem because we don't know how things have changed. We don't know. Me. Yeah. Yeah. If I was in college back back in 1970, which I was, 70, I'm in college. And they brought some guy in that was 70 years old to do comedy. We'd have, we'd have days probably. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, yeah. you know, he, he's a, they're talking about kids and hippie, you know, right? We're like, hey, that's us, pal. Yeah. You know, yeah. Talk you know, gender. They go, you don't know. You don't know what's going on. Yeah. yeah. It's funny if I get in if I get in front of an audience of twenty somethings. The only way, so there's a novelty factor to it. So it's almost like if you're a TikTok star, you've got a couple minutes where there's a novelty factor. But if I'm not making fun of my generation, then there's nothing. There's nothing there. Yeah. So I've learned that I have to make fun of my generation at least part of my act. Or or be truthful. If you're truthful, if you try 
to pander to them. I mean, the, the, like yeah. Rodney says, you know, individually, they may be orangutans, but as a group, they're genius. So you're trying to pander them. But if you're trying to do references to show that you're hip with everything, and hey, peeps, or whatever, hang or whatever, uh-huh. you know, they'll know immediately you're trying to pander. Yeah. But if you're up there being off and being honest with what's going on, you you get again the novelty factor. They may tolerate you for a while. A show of a bunch of comedians, everybody's on for ten minutes. All right, we can tolerate this guy for ten minutes. He's funny, or but uh, in terms of uh, attracting that as an audience, attracting you have to have something like I think again going back back to Rodney or Lewis Black parody your generation yeah yeah the last time i saw yeah the last time i saw lewis black it was the audience was almost all my age or a little bit older there are there are a few younger ones in there but yeah it's even even though his his commentary is very astute for the times uh and and young people could learn from it, it, it it's just the age thing it's just you know he, he he's an older gentleman well, okay so you're again how old are you now 58 you're 58 so again you're and i think in generations but there is 20 you normally in 20 year generation and and lewis is about maybe so you know again if there's people in the fifties, that's he attracted, right? He attracted them. Yeah. He's not necessarily going to attract generation. Right. You know? Right. Carlin, absolute freak. He had four incarnate times. Yeah. He attracted a young audience. Yeah. Amazing. Never happens. Never. Yeah. And and when you look at the when you look at his work from the time that. What was was he on the Smothers Brothers? He he he, he was on some weird. No, no, that Steve Smothers Brothers show, but but um, when George Carlin started, he was the, did a lot before he started doing Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So he did like Mike Douglas and were those those were daytime talk shows. Um, he had the 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 Indian Sergeant, yeah, talking to the the uh, you know a cow. Cavalry sergeant would talk to the cavalry troops before a battle, and I remember, and I remember that bit when I was young because he would do it on every one of those shows, and, uh, uh, yeah. and then and then because he that in that mode in the early '60s when he broke away, he was sort of like in that uh, Bob Newhart button-down mind mode, you know, with yeah, yeah, long pieces, right, and. um uh, and and sat, you know media and satirizing um, advertising and all, which was a big thing that the new heart. It's uh, it's it's amazing. Then all of a sudden he he comes back and he's this hip, oh, here, hippie. Yeah. Go, what? Yeah. What? There's a there's one on there's a a video on YouTube. I'll have to send you. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's one of the first times he did hippy dippy weatherman and. One of the one of the big one of the I, the funniest parts of Hippy Dippy Weatherman is when he says, "I'm the Hippy Dippy Weatherman with all the Hippy Dippy Weather Man," and the first time he did it, he didn't do that. He said, "I'm the Hippy Dippy Weatherman," and then he just went into the act, and so yeah. he hadn't developed that part yet. It's it's really neat to see that because it totally changes the dynamic of that little bit. Well, you. See that that one album AMC, the transition being made where he's moving toward that that character. Uh-huh. You, you hear him on Class Clown in '72. He's got the long hair, the beard, and it's almost like it's funny because Cheech and Chong were at the same time. He could have been the third partner, man. Yeah. Hey, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hey, man. Far out, man. You know, but, <laughs> Oh man. Well, I, I gotta tell you, this has been a great talk. Um, and I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and, uh, 
the book, uh, both books, I, I, I got to get the I Killed book, but the Kicking Through the Ashes, you know, I read that and, you know, you were you were coming up in my formative years. So all the comedians you mentioned, I saw on, you know, evening at the improv and stuff like that. And it's really yeah. great to put context to that. And the stories are just fantastic. So the book is definitely, I think it's a must read for any comedian. Well, I, I put a lot of effort into it. I'm putting a lot of effort into some things now. And I'm going to write a, I'm writing a, a novel about a, a comedy club, which is based, on truth in, in East Lansing, Michigan, 1981, it lasted six months. Oh. It's a great story, and I and I'm I, I'm really lo I love working on that right now. That's but there's great. The other it's... things I mean, we want we want to do the the stand up history show, and it's something larger than just my live act. I think there's yeah there's so much there. I mean, when I do it, there's just so much there. I mean, we, you we, you and people like, bring out comics that. You know, Lord Buckley, whoever. You know who Lord Buckley was? You know, I know that name. Very influential. Very influential. Robin Williams County and very uh, wild and out and out there. I mean, you talk about a guy crossing the line. Oh, there was no difference to him performing off stage and on. There was no difference. Uh -huh. he was, if he decided he was on, he was on. Didn't matter if he where he was. Yeah. And, and, and the wild guy. You know, back in the back in the thirties and forties, he came up working the. Uh, anyway, so you know how influential he was, but you never heard him. He's there's guys like that who you go, nobody's ever heard. But the comics back then knew who he was. Yeah, yeah. Lenny Bruce, Lenny Bruce was a by Lord Buckley. Uh -huh. They worked together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I you know I think yeah. what you have, I, mean, I think what you have could be put into a documentary because you know binders uh documentary on the comedy store was was just fantastic and i think it was a big hit oh yeah um, i i loved it <laughs> yeah yeah I I, it. It, it, it was yeah. great for there, me there things i did yeah yeah absolutely and 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 of course mike was out there and he was there he did a great job yeah yeah I tell you, I, I appreciate you being on the show. Um, where can folks find you if they want to see where you're playing or see um, what you got going on? Yeah, R I T C H S H Y D N E R dot com. Will let me know, let them know what. Um, and and you know, I got to guess I'm mostly on Facebook, and I'm starting. I'm going to put these videos out short. Uh, you know stand up for a minute like history bits little mm -hmm. little things that, that entertain so we're, we're starting to produce those and just having fun and just still having, that's... you know somebody wants to go are you gonna retire i go retire from <laughs> this <does> not work <laughs> <laughs> when i have to fly that's when you know and you know the flying but the rest of it is just fun yeah yeah, I and your documenting of you know the both your time and the history, I think it, it's important because you know there it's amazing how many young comedians do look back. I, I've I've interviewed so many of them in their twenties, and they know they know of Moms Mabley, they know who Richard Pryor is, they they know who wow. Dick Gregory, Great. and 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 they uh, the really the ones who are really um, I guess interested in the craft they do look back to see what they did so that they know what the structure is and it's really it's really cool to see that a lot of people say that the young kids aren't they don't care about uh history or anything like that i i see the opposite you just you just mentioned the answer to the earlier question was there a guy that walked had been even a bigger star dick gregory yeah. dick gregory Height when he went up the clubs and moving greater and greater, gave up his career to, to go, not just but to work with him. Gave up his career for the civil rights movement. Yeah, really, the most comics ever do that. Yeah, he gave it up for a social cause, put his effort into that, and you know, that that there's the guy right there. That's uh -huh. the only guy I can think of my generation, but Dick Greasy. Yeah, he. 
He was his 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 monologues were just fantastic. And uh, but but the, you thought there's a guy at U.S. Is there somebody who walked away? It could have been a bigger star. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Well, thanks so much for doing the show, Rich. It's been it's been great talking to you live and great getting to know you. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure.